Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, welcome again to this World Revenue Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. And today uh, we are very happy to invite uh, uh, Dr. Valley Galley from Wuzho come here talk about Himalaya organic carbon cycling and global cooling. Cooling is chicken or egg. So uh, this talk series is co-sponsored by NSF, uh, NC State, uh, Louisiana State University, Sticky Lab, uh, National uh, Normal University, uh, Eastern Normal University in China, and Utrecht. So. Uh, so before I introduce uh, Valley, and as always, this talk series so far has already more than 115, it's already 115 talks. And all, of, all the talks have been archived on the YouTube channel and also Billy Station. So feel free to use them as a research and a, a teaching education purpose. And at the same time, we also maintain a source to sync Twitter account. As you can see, we will announce all the new talk, all the news publication related community stuff. So you're welcome to follow us. So next week, next Wednesday, we have John Hawkins from UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, come here talk about Greenland, the elemental export from Greenland ice sheet to the coastal ocean, and a very interesting talk. So next week, same time. So, and very Gally, as I mentioned, now is a, a tenured associate a scientist at Woodhull Oceanography Institute. Very graduate uh, with a master of geology from the Institute National is a politic uh, Nick Delohan. So uh, uh, from France and also PhD from uh, Santo. Do, uh, how to say this? Uh, uh, do, 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 do Hershesh. Do Hershesh. And uh, is a, a petrographic geochemics. Oh, bear me, my French. Gosh. And so uh, that's the. Uh, I need a break in France. Maybe have a vacation in Nice. <laughs> um, anyway, he is a, after that. He was a postdoc, assistant scientist, associate scientist, and now tenured scientist over there. Her, uh, his research is mainly focused on the uh, free will transfer of organic carbon from a continent, from the mountains reservoir to the ocean, and ocean and carbon cycle in the critical zone, and also the impact of climate change and uh, the carbon, the CO2 also involve the radio carbon dating. So Valley, now I'll give the floor to you. So go ahead to share your screen and for the presentation mode. Okay. Nice work. Yes, looks good. Yeah. All right, thanks Paul for the uh, invitation. Thanks for the introduction. Sorry for the hard French words to uh, go through on my resume, I apologize for that. And yes, you should definitely go spend some time in France, especially now that we have five more years of a Republican country as opposed to an autocracy. So that's uh, not a bad thing. Um, all right, so thanks so much again for uh, the invitation. Um, I figured uh, I would uh, uh, spend the talk today talking a um, little bit about organic carbon cycling in the, the source to sink uh, Himalaya Bengal fan system, um, but the, the the main point I wanna I wanna make today is uh, looking at the global budgets of uh, uh, carbon burial, um, and to do that you have to go uh, at the downstream end of the source to sink system, which is the, the Bengal fan. So much of the talk today is going to revolve around looking at the Bengal fan, which is the receptacle of the uh, erosion products from the, the Himalayan system. Uh, I should mention that uh, uh, there's lots of people who've uh, participated in this line of research. Uh, my uh, colleagues in France, Christian Francano and my brother Albert Gali, uh, and uh, the rest of uh, the IODP expedition 354, as well as some colleagues here in the US, um, uh, namely Sarah Fickins at USC uh, for some of the organic uh, ice top analysis. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Peter uh, Molnar, who's been a great inspiration to do some of this work. And I've uh, 
shamelessly borrowed uh, half of the title of one of his uh, iconic paper uh, for my talk. All right, so uh, before we head uh, into um, uh, the specifics of the Himalayan Bengal fan system, I just want to spend a little bit of time on uh, uh, some of the basics, you know, laying down some of the basics of the global long-term carbon cycle, just to get people oriented and remind you of some of the important features of the carbon cycle. Uh, this is a very simplistic uh, sketch uh, of some of the key uh, pools of carbon at the surface or near surface of the earth, uh, along with some of the key fluxes between these reservoirs. And the, the point I really want to make here is that if you look at the size, the relative size of these different reservoirs, the atmosphere, uh, which in the pre industrial is somewhere a little bit above 700 gigatons of carbon, uh, is really quite small compared to uh, many of these other reservoirs. Uh, certainly, if you consider carbonates and, and uh, kerogen. Uh, which are in the 10 to the 6 gigatons, uh, but also if you consider smaller reservoirs like ocean DIC, uh, soils, and terrestrial plants, uh, you can see that the atmosphere is, is relatively small in comparison. The anthropogenic emissions of about 10 gigatons per year are also very sizable compared to the size of the atmosphere, and that's why uh, we are raising the atmospheric CO2 very substantially. And so much like the anthropogenic emissions, what this uh, really shows is that the, the size of the atmospheric reservoir really is sensitive to small imbalances uh, between the various processes that move carbon between these different reservoirs. Uh, so you don't need to have a large perturbation uh, of any one of these uh, particular fluxes going in and out of these uh, different carbon pools to have uh, potentially a fairly significant impact on the size of the atmospheric reservoir. And of course, this is dependent upon the time scale over which the perturbation uh, persists. And so we can look uh, for the long-term uh, carbon cycle, we can look at the balance, thinking about the sources and the sinks of carbon uh, from the atmospheric uh, standpoint. On the source uh, end, and, and I'm, uh, uh, summarizing here, you know, it, uh, it's in reality quite a bit more complex, but uh, you can summarize the sources to volcanism and metamorphic activity, uh, the oxidation of sedimentary organic carbon. This is something that uh, Bob Hilton uh, spoke about at great length uh, just a few weeks ago in this uh, seminar series. Uh, and then the, the last one, uh, which is uh, uh, actually quite important quantitatively, is the uh, oxidation of sulfur minerals, pyrite chiefly coupled with carbonate weathering. Um, so these, these three uh, sources uh, of CO2 also act on the oxygen uh, part of the uh, global element cycles by being mostly sink of oxygen over long time scales. And of course, uh, we have to have natural sinks to compensate for these sources such that the atmosphere doesn't become infinitely charged with CO2. And uh, these sinks, natural sinks are mainly uh, the oxidation, the weathering of uh, silicon minerals on land um, or in the oceanic crust, coupled with carbonate precipitation in the ocean, uh, which interestingly only affects uh, carbon, doesn't impact oxygen. Uh, and the second one is the one that uh, I'm actually most interested in and that the, this talk is going to be mostly about, is uh, photosynthetic production of organic matter coupled with burial of this photosynthetic organic carbon in uh, sedimentary systems. So uh, naturally, we have to have some kind of a balance between the source and the sinks, such that the atmosphere remains relatively in check with respect to its uh, uh, amount of uh, carbon and CO2. Um, and uh, how this uh, balance persists or gets tipped off has been a uh, subject of uh, great uh, interest and uh, uh, discussion and debate over uh, the last uh, several decades. Um, and here I'm just showing one, uh, one particular example of one of the, the idea by which um, the, the balance between the, the atmospheric CO2 levels and the processes by which uh, carbon is being sequestered or, or injected in the atmosphere uh, uh, works. And this is based on uh, uh, Walker's work, whereby uh, you can uh, imagine having um, erosion being front and center uh, in, in these regulation mechanisms, because erosion has 
is a pretty large lover on, uh, on both of the sinks of uh, CO2, natural sinks of CO2, uh, which are silicon weathering and organic carbon burial, just to remind you. Um, so this uh, uh, realization that erosion in, in mountainous areas is, is very important in controlling uh, the extent to which carbon is being sequestered uh, via these two processes has led to various um, uh, propositions of regulation mechanisms whereby uh, you, can, you could have um, a response of increased mass rate CO2 Uh, keeping the system in check. But you can also think of this as uh, uh, not a regulating um, uh, system, but instead a system that you can push off balance if, for instance, you were to increase uh, erosion, the connectivity that can be, if, for instance, all of a sudden you create a new mountain range. And, and that's uh, exactly what I want to uh, talk about today in the context of the Himalayas. Uh, and this is, um, oh yeah, before I, I do that, uh, just a, a, a summary of the, um, really the, the, the idea here is that erosion is, is uh, central uh, to uh, controlling the efficiency of these mechanisms that sequester carbon, silicon weathering and organic carbon burden. Um, and, and I just wanna show that, that this is, at least in the modern systems, uh, largely true. This is a plot showing efficiency of CO2 sequestration through uh, either silicate weathering the, the crosses or uh, organic carbon burial in the dots as a function of erosion rates, sediment yields here in the, in the x-axis. You can see that we have positive relationships uh, in, in both cases. So uh, it's a lot more complex than just being erosion, but uh, it's pretty indisputable that increasing erosion rates has positive uh, effect on uh, the uh, the rate at which uh, CO2 is being sequestered via uh, either silicate weathering or organic common burial. Looks like it's steeper for organic common burial than it is for a silicate weathering. So maybe there is an even bigger lever um, on that side of the, of the carbon cycle. Okay, so with that said, um, um, zooming in onto the Himalayas, um, where it is very clear uh, from all what we know about the technical evolution of, of this part of the world, that there's been you know, very profound, dramatic uh, perturbation uh, that, that arose from the, the initiation of the collision between India and Eurasia uh, somewhere uh, a little bit prior to 50 million years. And uh, this is on the right hand side here the, the convergence rate between India and, and Asia that shows the dramatic slowdown as soon as the, the, the collision uh, initiates. And obviously that slowdown uh, um, gave the origin to the rise of uh, the Tibetan plateau and, and the Himalayan range, uh, which is currently the largest uh, um, uh, origin on earth. And that gives the, the birth to the largest uh, sedimentary system on earth, which is the development plan. And so uh, along with the exhumation of, of the Himalayas, there have been several uh, pretty uh, dramatic changes in, in global element cycles. Uh, uh, for instance, here, the seawater strontium isotope composition uh, uh, very likely in part reflects uh, the uh, uh, erosion of very radiogenic terrains uh, that were uplifted uh, during the, uh, the formation of, of the Himalayas. Uh, and so uh, this has uh, very naturally led people to think that that might have been a large enough perturbation um, tectonic perturbation to uh, tip the carbon cycle off balance. And so if we look here on the left-hand side now, the plot, we have the iconic Zakos uh, benthic foraminifera stack uh, that shows the you know, global cooling uh, over uh, much of the Cenozoic and, and the apparition of permanent ice sheets in the Southern hemisphere and Northern hemisphere in, in sequence. Uh, and then here in the middle, the uh, uh, one of the computations quite outdated now uh, one of the computations of atmospheric CO2 reconstructions showing uh, this really uh, pronounced decrease in CO2 concentrations uh, over the Cenozoic, um, especially in the first uh, part of the Cenozoic. So people have postulated that uh, the, the resurrection of the Himalayas, that tectonic perturbation, might have tipped the carbon cycle of balance 
increased, uh, dramatically increased erosion that, that's undisputable and that uh, dramatic increase in erosion processes might have led to increased carbon consumption and potentially participated in, if not led, uh, the Cenozoic uh, global cooling. So the, the talk today is really uh, gonna focus on, on these processes and trying to understand uh, if and, and how uh, that might have happened, uh, especially through the uh, lens of organic carbon burial, which I'm gonna show you in a minute is, is really uh, the key carbon consuming uh, phenomenon in, in this part of the world. Okay, so uh, here we are. This is a combination of uh, a lot of the uh, work that's been done looking at modern rivers draining the Himalayas and discharging into the Bay of Bengal and trying to, through uh, studying river chemistry, uh, characterize the uh, magnitude and the efficiency of uh, these natural uh, CO2 uh, sources and sink uh, processes. So uh, we've got the sinks here, uh, uh, negative numbers. Uh, this is in the 10 to 11 mod per year. And then the sources in, in positive numbers. And then uh, um, here on the right-hand side, this is the net uh, balance uh, for the modern system based on the study of modern river systems. Silicate weathering is relatively modest. And that is because uh, there's a, a very strong uh, limitation of the rates by um, uh, essentially the, the rate at which um, uh, these rocks are being eroded. Um, uh, biospheric burial, uh, burial of biospheric organic carbon in the sedimentary system is comparatively a much, much larger uh, carbon sink. And then on the sources side of things, you've got sulfide oxidation, metamorphic degassing, which is arguably fairly poorly constrained and oxidation of uh, pathogenic organic carbon, rock-derived uh, organic carbon, that are essentially of about the same magnitude around 1, 10 to the 11 molecule. And so when you, when you look at the overall balance, you end up with the modern system being a net carbon sink. So that would be assuming the rates we're measuring in the modern environment are applicable over fairly long time scales, let's say 10 to the, at least 10 to the 4, probably more 10 to the 5 years. And if that's true, uh, then the, the erosion of the Himalayas, uh, as it happens now, would be a net carbon sink uh, of about 0.85, 10 to the 11 mol per year. Uh, just to get, uh, give you a, a better sense of what that is, that uh, the 10 to the 11 mol per year might not speak much to you guys. Um, you can translate that into petagrams per kilo years, for instance, which is a unit that's easier to, uh, to understand. And that amounts to about 10 petagrams of carbon per kilo year. So every uh, thousand years, it's about one year of anthropogenic CO2 emission, uh, which is uh, actually very significant. So obviously, if uh, that was to be true and that was to hold for uh, a long time scales, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 years, uh, that very quickly amounts to astronomical amounts um, of uh, carbon. And uh, obviously, they have to be other compensating um, sources out there uh, to make up for it. But it's just to show that the modern system is really dominated by the, the burial of biospheric carbon in uh, the Bengal fence sediments. Uh, and and uh, as such uh, is uh, very clearly uh, a sink uh, of uh, atmospheric carbon uh, on long-term scales. And so the, the real question is whether or not that has persisted uh, throughout the history of, of the Himalayan range and, um, and beyond uh, whether it has changed, uh, whether that uh, has remained the case, uh, or whether there have been variations in, in magnitude, uh, or even a change in the sign of uh, this net uh, carbon sink. So uh, to answer that question, uh, we had to turn uh, away from uh, the modern system and, and the modern rivers. Uh, and uh, uh, go through the much harder task of retrieving sediment cores uh, from the sedimentary receptacle, which is the, the Bengal Uh So in 2015, we sailed on the joint resolution uh, during our EP expedition 354 to drill a transect uh, at about eight degrees north in the, in the distant Bengal fan and, and retrieve uh, sediment records uh, of uh, human immersion. So uh, just to uh, get you oriented, uh, the Bengal fan 
uh, sits um, uh, here south of uh, the uh, collision zone between India and uh, the Indian plate and uh, the Eurasian plate and, and the Himalayan range. Uh, the, um, um, I mean, look at the scale here, 24 kilometers. So the thickness of the sediment uh, accumulated in the Bengal fan is, is uh, uh, simply uh, astronomical in, in the tens of kilometers. Uh, and it extends to the south uh, for uh, about 3,000 kilometers. The sediments are being delivered here to the shelf and, and brought down uh, several thousands of uh, kilometers via turbidity systems, which I'm going to get into in, in a minute. Um, so obviously, uh, we're, for practical reasons, uh, we decided to drill in, in a, a fairly distal uh, position here in the Bengal fan, such that the sediment signals would be somewhat manageable. Oops. Okay, so um, I just want to spend uh, a few minutes on uh, sediment uh, processes and, and sediment transport processes because they are pretty extraordinary and, and, and actually quite important with respect to understanding the, the sediment reports. Uh, so this is now a, a map of the modern um, uh, Ganges Brahm Petra Delta here uh, in, in Bangladesh uh, that shows the, the shelf. Uh, it was very, very shallow. Uh, shelf here uh, that is cut by a very deep canyon, the stretch of no ground, uh, that directs sediments uh, from uh, the Sibacoast Delta down to the, the deep sea fan uh, via these uh, turbulent uh, systems. Um, there is currently an active channel that runs the length of the Bengal fan uh, that's been uh, documented and imaged, uh, and that's uh, remarkably um, well-defined um, and, and pretty incredible to actually consider that the turbidites are traveling thousands of kilometers from the shell here down to south of the equator uh, in, in the Bengal fan. And so when we look at the, the sediment uh, cores that we retrieved from the transect, uh, we can uh, find uh, several different uh, sedimentary features. The dominant feature is the so-called Bouma sequence that's related to the deposition uh, of sediments uh, uh, related to turbidity activity. Um, and uh, you can see here on, on the left-hand side, these like very characteristic sequences that are finding upward. It can be up to several tens of centimeters thick corresponding to one turbidity event. Uh, we also found uh, some very, very thick sand units that correspond to overspill uh, that was quite, um, um, maybe not a surprise, but we, I don't think we anticipated to find this much sand, sometimes uh, medium to coarse sand, this far away, 2,000 kilometers from, uh, from the mass of the rivers. So this corresponds to overspill that uh, happens uh, when the turbidites breach the, their levees. And the Miocene here, you can see that um, these uh, turbidites are still there. They become somewhat compacted, but actually, uh, not very much to the point that we could still use piston carrying down to uh, uh, 600 meters uh, below the seafloor. Uh, and then interspace between these turbidites, there's hemipelagic units that are usually pretty thin, bioturbated, um, uh, enriched, somewhat enriched in, in marine uh, calcium carbonates. Um, so um, that's the, the type of sediments we are, we are interested in, obviously. In the work I'm going to show today, I'm going to be really focusing on those uh, turbidite units that are directly related to the transport of sediments deriving from Himalayan uh, So this is now the transect that we drilled at uh, eight degrees north, um, all the way to uh, the west flank of the active uh, channel here. And this is just zooming on uh, the Pleistocene record uh, that is really dominated by the migration of the channel, uh, uh, west and east and west and east. And, and you can imagine this uh, a little bit like a, a, a river, a braided river uh, uh, spanning its fan, uh, but uh, in the in the submarine system. So very clearly, uh, all of these buried levees and channels show us that the system is migrating. 
And uh, as such, if you want to capture geodetic sedimentation in the fan, you have to drill across a transect such that you're sure to have uh, at least one of your cores or uh, the sites that receives uh, geodetic sedimentation. So you can't uh, really rely on one site. And that's why we drill this transect of sites across. Um, long sites, when you have three of them, um, and here on the left, I'm showing the uh, reconstructed uh, accumulation rates uh, based on uh, biostereographic constraints and, and uh, polymagnetic constraints. Um, and, and this shows that, um, just as I said, there are periods of time when the accumulation is very fast at one site and so on another site and vice versa. So you really have to take, congregate those uh, different records to end up with uh, uh, some kind of a, a more or less um, complete and continuous uh, record of geometric sedimentation. One thing that is important to note is that uh, it's very, very dangerous to base recon uh, reconstructions of sediment uh, fluxes based on uh, just one of these sites because of the fact that, that the depot center is migrating. Uh, so it's very dangerous, for instance, to argue that uh, based on, on here, the Eastern Mount site in 1451, there's been a slowdown of sedimentation uh, here in, in the Miocene because at that exact same time, you see an increase in the rates at, at some of the more central sites. Uh, so overall, uh, you know, looking at it uh, uh, was this very, very simplistic representation. It doesn't look like there is any major organized change in, in sediment accumulation rates uh, over the time period which in our case cover about 20 million years. So we can uh, start to look uh, a little bit at the composition of these uh, chocolatic sediments that we've been retrieving. Uh, and we are very fortunate to have worked very extensively on the modern river system. So we can use the composition of modern river sediments as uh, a point of comparison to get us oriented. And so here on the top, I'm just showing grain size, that's the D84 uh, parameter in, in microns uh, as a function of aluminum silicon ratios. And on the uh, lower plot, that's uh, iron silicon uh, as a function of aluminum silicon. So these are some of the main sedimentological and geochemical parameters that, that define uh, the composition of the sediments uh, in terms of their uh, grain size and in terms of their mineralogy, uh, low aluminum silicon ratios being uh, skewed towards coarse uh, quartz grains and then high mean silicon ratios being skewed towards uh, finer silicates and finer grain grains. So what we can see is that if we compare uh, both in grain size and, and, and bulk uh, uh, inorganic geochemistry, the Bengal fan sediments at eight degrees north in, in blue and uh, the river sediments in Bangladesh, we have this like, remarkable agreement uh, in, in composition. So we really are sampling uh, down at eight degrees north, uh, the products of Himalayan erosion that look just like the products of Himalayan erosion we are sampling in the rivers uh, in Bangladesh over the last uh, two decades. And so we can go a little bit uh, further by using geochemical tracer of uh, provenance uh, to, to check uh, if we are indeed dealing with these uh, Himalayan products of erosion. Uh, so these are very simplistic uh, geological representations of the, the units, the lithologic units uh, in the Himalayas. Um, uh, all you have to know is that there is this, because of the, the uh, uh, thrusting system, there is this uh, succession of very different lithologies that happen to carry uh, quite distinct um, isotope composition in, in some isotope systems, such as strontium, uh, radiogenic isotopes and nearly new isotopes. And so we can do some source tracing uh, by looking at uh, nearly new and strontium isotope composition of the products of erosion. Uh, we've done that, uh, I should say, not we, but um, uh, some have done that, my brother included, in a modern river system. So we have some understanding of the composition uh, of the erosion products uh, in Bangladesh, uh, Ganges in green, the brown Petra in red and, and mixing of the two in yellow. Um, uh, here, uh, these are modern river sediments plotted in the uh, neodymium versus uh, 87, 86 strontium uh, diagram. And uh, what you can see is that the main lithological units uh, of the trans Himalaya, the high Himalaya, the Tetian uh, sedimentary series and the lesser Himalaya define this broad mixing array uh, on which the modern rivers are sitting. 
So based on this, we can define you know, the blend, if you wish, of these different mythologies contributing to a sediment export at, uh, at the mouth of the Ganges Valley. And so again, that gives us a really good point of comparison to uh, look at all uh, samples from the transect at eight degrees north. Uh, and when we do that, uh, I've zoomed in so you can actually see a little bit of the details, but you still have the main units of the Trans Himalaya, Lesser Himalaya, High Himalaya, and, and Tetis Himalaya here. And you can see that, uh, and this is now color coded by age here um, from zero to 20 million years. And you can see that. The sediments, these chobidite sediments that we recovered, always uh, plot on some kind of an array that very much resembles uh, the river array uh, that was defined here by the modern rivers. So overall, there is a, a stability of the provenance uh, in terms of the contribution of these main Himalayan mythologic units. If you look in details, there is some organized secular variability here with all of the young. Uh, data points uh, sitting here actually on top of the modern rivers and some of the older measurements being off uh, uh, that trend, which tells us there has been some variability in the composition of the um, sediments eroded from the Himalayas over time. Uh, so if we look at those variability uh, very quickly, because it's not the, the main point of that talk, uh, we have now here on the left, the some sort of a moving average of the epsilon neodymium composition over time. And you can see that there have been periods of time with uh, uh, pretty dramatic changes in uh, ice of composition. And we can relate this to what we know about the evolution, tectonic evolution of the human range, chiefly uh, the, uh, uh, the surrection of uh, or the exposition to erosion of uh, the lesser Himalaya here. Uh, sometime in, in the Miocene, in, in the late Miocene. So this all makes very good sense. Uh, we can also look at, at another very interesting uh, uh, feature of these sediments, and that is their uh, detrital carbonate content. So sediments uh, brought up by the modern rivers uh, uh, do contain uh, several percent of uh, detrital carbonates. Uh, this is pretty unique for such a very large river system. Many really large river systems have very limited carbonate uh, concentrations. Uh, but the, the Himalayas have uh, a combination of having uh, quite a few carbonate rocks uh, and a very fast erosion rate uh, that limits the rate at which uh, these carbonates are being uh, weathered, such that some persist uh, at the mass of the rivers. So if we look at the, the sediments uh, from um, the 20 million year old record at the eight degrees north, we can see that we have very significant detrital carbonate uh, contents at all times. Uh, if anything, it seems to be systematically higher than the modern system. And there are some periods of time, again, some secular variations, and some periods of times with much higher carbonate content, uh, close to 10% on average, uh, than, than in, the, in the modern times. So this is telling us two interesting things. One, it, it reveals uh, the, the secular uh, change in uh, the uh, uh, exposure and erosion of uh, the, the uh, Tetis Himalaya rocks, which are carbonated. And, and two, uh, it shows us that uh, because we always have very significant carbonate uh, concentrations, um, the, the carbonates are always um, supply, the, the uh, uh, weathering of carbonates is never supply limited. So we're always dealing with weak chemical weathering intensity. And if anything, just based on the carbonates, which are very sensitive uh, because they, uh, they weather pretty uh, easily, if anything, it looks like we're dealing, we're dealing with um, weaker uh, weathering intensity throughout the record than in the modern system. Um, okay, so I'll skip this. So we can also look at silicate weathering. Uh, so again, just to get you oriented, and uh, showing a, a little bit of the work we've done in the modern rivers. Uh, this is now looking at potassium over silicon. Potassium is one of the main cations uh, from silicates uh, that weathers during uh, chemical weathering as a function of an aluminum silicon ratio, which is again a proxy for uh, you know, bulk uh, mineral composition, I mean, quartz here and uh, coarse quartz here and, and fine grain phytosilicates there. So when, when we uh, uh, compare the uh, rivers at the Himalayan front and then uh, the rivers in the footplain and, and then the, the main uh, trunk 
of the Ganges in Bangladesh, we can see this progressive loss of potassium. So potassium to silicon decreases at a given aluminum silicon ratio uh, uh, going from the mountains all the way down to Bangladesh. And this is uh, the characteristic signature of uh, silicate weathering in, in this system. So that defines the intensity of silicate weathering in, in the modern system. So we can play uh, that same game with the, the sediments uh, from the Bengal fan that we retrieved over the, the transect at Lake North. Uh, and again, showing potassium silicon over, again, studying the silicon ratio, uh, plotting again the Himalayan front rivers and then the lower Meghna, which is the mixing of Ganges and Putra. Uh, so again, that, that, that shift between one and the other is the characteristic loss of potassium in the modern system, which uh, just as a reminder, is relatively modest in terms of how that translates into uh, uh, flux uh, of uh, uh, weathering. Um, so we can now look at all of the samples from uh, the deep banger fan. And this is all the, the blue uh, symbols here with the, all of the different sites along the transect. And they all plot very tightly on that array uh, that for the most part is sitting actually quite a bit closer uh, to the Himalayan front rivers than it sits to the modern uh, lower Magna River. So if anything, based on this, and I'm not gonna go into the details because that's mostly the work of uh, Christian Fasano and, and my brother Albert. Um, but if anything, we can define the, 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 the characteristic chemical weathering intensity uh, of the last 20 million years as being um, probably lower uh, or not greater than what we've been seeing by uh, studying the modern rivers. So that really uh, constrains the extent to which uh, silicate weathering has been an important mechanism of carbon sequestration um, over time. Okay, so now on to the, the more quantitatively important and, and arguably, from my point of view, more interesting uh, phenomenon, and that is the uh, burial of organic carbon uh, in, in these uh, Bengal fan settings. So uh, again, we can turn to uh, the, the rivers. Um, remember, this is a source to sing talk, so I think it's uh, appropriate to show a little bit of the river work uh, to get you oriented. So we can turn to the modern rivers, to try to understand um, carbon fluxes and carbon burial in, in the modern system. Um, uh, one thing that uh, we realized very quickly when we start to work in these rivers is that there is a, a very large contrast in, in sediment concentration and sediment properties over the depth of these rivers, which is typically anywhere between 10 and 20 meters. Uh, so this is here, the, the uh, Grand Putra in Bangladesh, where you have about one gram per liter in the surface and then more than six gram per liter of suspension at 10 meters. Uh, and along with this change in concentration, there's a drastic change in sediment properties, sediments becoming coarser and coarser, uh, moving down towards the dead load. Organic carbon concentrations, follow along very much. So here I'm plotting organic carbon concentrations as a function of aluminum silicon ratio. So again, four squats here on the low end of the aluminum silicon ratio spectrum, um, and then um, fine grain fine silicates here at the, at the high end of the spectrum. And you can see uh, organic carbon concentrations are uh, very uh, uh, linearly correlated with aluminum silicon ratio. So it really follows grain size and mineral properties. And that's great because we can use uh, these uh, uh, geochemical trends as, as a starting point to compare um, this, the Bengalton sediments with. Uh, so that, that slope here defines the, the carbon loading of the river system. And also that tells us we have to be very careful when we look at one organic carbon concentration. It doesn't mean much in isolation of the corresponding sediment properties because of this very, very strong control of uh, sediment composition on organic carbon concentration. Uh, that's not unique to the Bengal fan, by the way, it's something that's been seen more or less in every sedimentary system. So uh, when we look at uh, sediments from the, uh, the, the Bengal fan uh, collected uh, uh, throughout the fan, uh, but in the relatively uh, shallow uh, horizon layer, sediment layer, so we're looking mostly at uh, sediments from the Holocene, um, we can look at the composition of that organic matter. Here, this is a plot of the uh, uh, stabilized composition of long-chain fatty acids, which are only produced by vascular plants. 
as a function of the uh, stabilized composition of the bulk organic matter. Uh, and in these sediments, we find these uh, uh, pretty uh, spectacular uh, correlation. And the only way to get there is by uh, essentially uh, understanding that the bulk of the organic matter is, is more or less entirely terrestrial. So there's very, very little contribution from uh, marine or aquatic um, uh, inputs in this system. And that is because of uh, the way that the sediments are being um, transferred very rapidly from uh, the shallow uh, subaqueous delta down to the deep sea fan through these, these uh, turbidites. So very uh, limited inputs of uh, non-terrestrial uh, organic uh, matter in, in these uh, recent Bengal fan sediments. And uh, we can now look at the loading, the carbon loading, uh, here, um, looking at the, the shell of channel levy and the distal fan, again, these are mostly Holocene sediments, uh, compared to the rivers in blue. And you can see that for a given sediment property, there is uh, more or less exactly the same amount of carbon in the Langer fan sediments as there is in, uh, in the river sediments. So that, that shows us that there is very minimal losses of uh, terrestrial organic matter. Uh, moving from the rivers down to the deep sea fan. And then this uh, really characterizes the system as being a very, very efficient at, at burying uh, the uh, terrestrial organic matter that it receives uh, from uh, its uh, rivers filling it. Okay, so with that in mind, we can now look at uh, the results uh, from the transect at 8 North covering uh, the last uh, 20 million years or so. Uh, and here I'm showing just a uh, uh, the uh, uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of data points uh, that we have for organic carbon concentration. This is one of the beauty of the uh, IODP uh, program. It gets you to measure uh, very routinely tens of samples uh, from each of these, uh, of these calls that you get uh, uh, on the ship for carbon concentration. So we have lots of data in addition to obviously the measurements we made uh, back in the lab. And at first, uh, you don't see very much, uh, except that the carbon concentrations are never very high and never goes much above, uh, you know, uh, uh, point, uh, point, point eight percent. Um, when you look at the aluminum silicon uh, ratio, um, that's a smaller data set. It doesn't look like there is any secular uh, trend there. So it doesn't seem that this report here is biased by a systematic change in, in print size. Um, oops. Now, one thing that we, I have to mention before I try to make some more um, educated um, guesses as to whether there are secular trends here in carbon concentrations uh, is the burial of wood debris in, in this city. This is something that we uh, literally um, stumbled upon while we were sampling these calls. Uh, uh, we realized at some point that, that uh, Virtually every of these turbidites had some kind of wood debris in them. Some of them had very, very visible, very large debris, multiple centimeters long, uh, and, and some had a very, very high concentrations of, of wood debris. Some of these wood debris, the most recent ones, you can still see the structure of the wood, so excellent preservation. So that got us interested in trying to understand you know, where these wood debris were coming from, how they were getting there and, and whether or not they were um, important uh, carbon burial standpoint. And so again, we found these wood debris in all kinds of different turbidites. They're easier to see in the older turbidites because of the, the compaction uh, and the water content being a little bit lower. But, but uh, this is the, the weight percent of wood um, uh, that, that we measured in the samples that we analyzed, there's huge uh, sampling artifact effect here, but essentially almost everywhere we looked for them, we could find very significant amounts of these wood debris throughout the entire 20 uh, million year report. So that seems to be quite, uh, quite important. Let me skip on this. And if we uh, look at the organic carbon concentration, uh, of some of these turbidites uh, as a function of aluminum silicon ratio to account for the sediment uh, property effect. You can see that in these, uh, these green uh, uh, points here are turbidites that contain vast amounts of debris. And then um, in the, uh, the black here, this uh, uh, 
turbidites that didn't seem to visually contain much wood. And the, the gray dots are the modern river sediments. And so you can see that in these turbidites that do contain very obviously large amount of woods, uh, the sand and the sealed portion of the turbidites uh, have these uh, carbon enrichment that are pretty significant, could be twice as much as what you have in like, these normal turbidites. So uh, all this to say that uh, this wood burial seems to be uh, quantitatively quite important. Uh, was really a, a really neat discovery to make and, and something that we need to dis to study more in details, especially with respect to the uh, its importance in terms of uh, the accumulation of uh, of carbon in the sediment. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, zooming back on the final part of the chubbyites, which we have studied more extensively, um, looking here at the composition of uh, long chain and alkanes only produced by vascular plants as a function of the bulk. So here, this is for the entire uh, 20 million year record. And again, we have this uh, striking uh, positive relationship that's telling us that the organic matter is so what we saw in the Holocene sediment seems to be holding true uh, for the most part in these turbidites uh, from uh, the entire report. And uh, we can now look at the organic carbon content uh, of these turbidites as a function of an silicon ratio compared with uh, the sediment from the modern river system in Bangladesh, the Royal Magna, the regular dots. And you can see that there's a, a whole range of data points that fall on the river line. And then there's a, a whole range of points that don't and that sit quite a bit lower, especially at the high end of the aluminum silicon ratio. So and now I can separate. Uh, these uh, uh, samples from the distal fan uh, in those that are less than 2 million uh, year old and those that are more than 2 million year old. And when I do that, I realize that everything that is less than 2 million year old sits exactly on the river line, much like the Holocene sediment. While um, all of these points here that are sitting low on that line, so that have much less carbon than in a modern system, happen to be uh, older uh, sediment. So clearly, we're dealing with some secular variation in carbon concentration. Here, trying to account for these um, sorting effects and separating uh, uh, silt and sand versus, uh, you know, the, the silt and clay or clay silt. And you can see that in the coarse grain, it doesn't seem to be much of a trend, but in the fine grain, there's this net increase in carbon concentrations here uh, in, in the uh, last five million, somewhere in the last five million years. And along with this, we can see a systematic, and it's very noisy, there's a lot of variability, uh, but then we can see the systematic increase in carbon to nitrogen ratio over that same time period. So very likely we're dealing with a change in, uh, in the burial efficiency in the preservation of these sediments uh, over the last five million years. So uh, with that, I can, uh, and getting towards the, uh, at the end of the talk, uh, with that, I can try to provide my uh, best estimate of the average uh, carbon content of these turbidites. And it's complicated because you have to account for all of these uh, uh, sediment sorting effects. And also, I should mention that this is not really explicitly taking uh, the wood burial into account. So that's a pretty significant caveat. But uh, when I do do that, I end up with this red curve here which is the average organic carbon content of uh, these uh, turbidite sediments over the last five million years, uh, plotted on top of uh, the black curve, which is the Liziki and Remo uh, delta weighting uh, benthic foram stack. And so what you can see is that uh, uh, this transition in the last five million years uh, towards uh, uh, globally generally cooler and, and much more climatically variable is the initiation of the glacial and glacial variability. Uh, seems to be accompanied by uh, this uh, um, increase. Uh, the, the axis for the organic carbon type, uh, content is flipped here. Uh, so it seems to be uh, coming with this sharp increase, almost doubling of the carbon concentrations uh, over the same time period. And just as a, a reminder, uh, this is the, uh, some of the most recent compilation of PCO2 reconstructions over the same time period. And um, again, it's quite a bit noisy, but overall they show uh, some, something like about 100 ppm CO2 drop uh, some, somewhere here uh, before the, uh, the prior place transition. 
So we're dealing with something quite interesting whereby Q2 is going down. Um, there's this global cooling and, and uh, yet we have an increase in carbon burial in the Bengal fan, so increased sequestration uh, of uh, organic carbon. So this is, this is where the chicken or egg part of the, the talk comes in. And the question becomes, are we dealing with a system that is responding to the global cooling and the drop in the CO2? And, and in that case, that would be a positive feedback actually. Or are we dealing with a system that is uh, somewhat responsible for uh, the observed uh, change in, uh, uh, in PCO2 and, and therefore the global cooling? Um, so to, do, to answer that question requires to have fluxes, which is very difficult. Um, um, we're working on with sedimentologists to uh, uh, reconstruct uh, uh, 3D um, volumes of uh, sediment uh, in the Bengal fan to try and, and do sediment budgets that way, but that's not quite uh, ready yet. Uh, what we do have is this uh, study from a couple of years ago by uh, uh, Sebastian Lenard, uh, who used uh, beryllium 10 to try and estimate uh, erosion rates uh, over the last uh, five or six million years. And that study tends to show a uh, very, very modest variability of the erosion rate. Uh, at the first order, we could argue that the, the erosion rates have remained uh, you know, pretty much constant over the last five or six million years. So uh, looping back to the beginning of the talk and this, this plot of the, the various um, uh, sources and sinks of carbon, if we assume that erosion rates have remained constant, if we assume that um, our assessment of biospheric carbon burial that, that doubled um, over the last five million years is correct, then we have this situation here uh, during much of the Miocene. Um, remember, we showed that silicate weathering uh, certainly wasn't higher. If, if anything, it might have been uh, lower, but I kept it constant for the sake of argument. Uh, so if we assume that this, uh, these different other uh, fluxes hold, uh, then we end up with a system that's actually a net source of just a little shy of 10 uh, petagrams per kilo year uh, in, in the Miocene. And um, remember, uh, at some point over the last five million years, we transitioned from this situation to that situation where the virus ray carbon burial doubles, nearly doubles, and that flips the system into being a net carbon sink of about 10 uh, petagrams per kilo year. So if you do this um, over a relatively quick time period, and if you then uh, hold this situation here over a relatively long time period, you end up uh, over the last five million years, you can very quickly end up talking thousands of petagrams of carbon um, being uh, sequestered. So an additional sequestration uh, of uh, thousands of uh, petagrams of carbon. This is, this is vast amounts of carbon that can explain uh, very, very easily in excess of 100 ppm of atmospheric uh, CO2. Obviously, just dealing with the Marias here, we have to take into account all of the other systems and must have responded to, to the, uh, the global uh, cooling as well. All right, and I'll leave it there. So we have a bit of time for questions, uh, but basically we're dealing with uh, system dominated by strong monsoon, very fast erosion throughout the last 20 million years. Uh, seems like uh, very weak chemical weathering rates that are strongly kinetic limited throughout. Um, organic carbon burial is, is the dominant sink throughout, but uh, it seems like it's strengthened uh, uh, quite a lot over the last five million years to stabilize over uh, the last 2 million years to something uh, that's similar to what we know today. Um, and if so, that, that could actually be a positive feedback. Um, and then uh, we, as uh, I said, we have to fully establish all of the fluxes, uh, which is uh, actually quite complicated, but we are we're working on it. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone uh, involved, uh, IDP, 354 cents, parking crew, obviously, NSF for funding, and then uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, Valley, this is uh, just an uh, unbelievable, fantastic talk. Uh, lots of information is, is uh, great. Uh, so uh, we still cannot answer the chicken or, or egg question, right? <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I think the jury is out uh, as, as far as uh, 
the last family unions are concerned, uh, I would argue the jury is still very much out. Um, uh, I have a feeling it's it's going to be complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I mean, that's a great part of the uh, the nature of the science. You know, we maybe have keep 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 doing that. Okay. Uh, any questions? So, if you have any question, you go ahead to unmute yourself, and you can go directly ask your valley. Okay. Okay, when the audience prepare the question, but I have a quick question. You know, you, you see the, the strengthening of the carbon uh, flux the import in the last two million years. So did you see the change of the nature of the material? I see, you, you know, there's many wood uh, part, you know, buried in all, all your sediment, all the coal. Uh, so it's uh, any, you see the difference of uh, the different tree from a different kind of uh, plants or any anything change um not in terms of the wood not very much actually that's maybe something i can show because i skipped that slide uh we tried to look at the uh, the provenance of the wood mm -hmm. um, by using some uh, isotope uh, uh techniques so we measured uh, stable carbon isotope of the bulk wood and also the, the, the hydrogen isotope composition of the methoxy group um, from that wood. And what that shows is basically that, uh, oh, and also we measured uh, uh, lignin concentrations and some of these characteristic mm -hmm. lignin monomer ratios. And what that shows is that uh, this wood is, to the exception of one particular horizon uh, in, in the very recent times is always uh, uh, super dominated by gen, uh, angiosperms, sorry. And it seems like in terms of its provenance, it's for the most part skewed towards lower elevation. Um, it doesn't seem like there is any, any big organized you know, variability uh, mm, in, the, in the provenance. I see. Of the so is, is this uh, from the... Uh, Elevation high, you know, you mentioned, is, is this related to the glacial melt or retreat? Uh, how they send it to the river, you know, delta, you know, or to, to the ocean? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, we don't know. Uh, we, every time we've been in on these rivers during the monsoon, you know, we've uh, unintentionally found ourselves almost uh, stuck uh, with, you know, a meter of, of uh, water in, in, uh, in the street in Dhaka and everything. So we've been out there in pretty extreme conditions and very high flow conditions. And we have never seen a very large amount of woods being uh, delivered by these rivers. So yeah. this leaves us with two, two possibilities, one being that uh, humans are making sure that that whatever is uh, uh, eroding that wood doesn't happen anymore. Um, and another possibility is that uh, this is um, more episodic um, sort of processes related to extreme events, uh, which could be you know catastrophic failure of uh, glacial uh, dams uh, up high in the gorges uh, or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're not entirely sure. It's uh, it's a okay. little bit of a puzzle at the moment. Sure. So One thing that's that's uh, certain is that humans have limited how much uh, the rivers are, are migrating uh, at the uh, outflow of the Himalayan range throughout their fans. So this has been uh, humans have tried to control that as much as possible. Uh, mm. So that could be a factor, certainly. Okay, so Valley, can you uh, exit the, the the full full screen? I mean, the, can you see the in the chat? Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a K, K hole has a question. It seems that global cooling is a major driver for the increase since the late Miocene years continent Bengal fan. And the long time scale, how did erosion relate to the Himalayan origin and contribute to the US continent Bengal fan and seas? Uh, the longer time scale is, a, is an open question. Um, I very much wish that we had a longer record. Unfortunately, we reached the, the pre-fan sediment um, at only 20 million, the, the only 20 million year mark. So we take another ELP expedition to, to core in the center 
uh, drilling core in the center and retrieve you know, 30, 35 million year old sediments. I would very much like to see what has happened uh, between 20 and, and 35. Between 20 and five, not much happens. It's, it's pretty constant. Of course, we have no idea of erosion rates uh, because we don't have the beryllium constraint there and we don't have volumetric reconstructions yet. So that's a little bit of an open question. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I was kind of provocative here in this talk uh, saying that maybe in the Miocene, the Himalayan erosion was actually a source and net source of uh, carbon uh, to, to the atmosphere. I think we are, we are still in some ways to actually find out for sure. Mm. Interesting. Uh, other way to look, you know, maybe look at the India and Masoon and, uh, you know, the variation. Is there anything related to moisture, rainfall, landslide, you know? Very little, as far as we can say, for, for those 20 million years. Um, I didn't show that, but we have uh, isotope, hydrogen isotope uh, composition of leaf waxes. So these uh, molecules only produced in the leaf of uh, vascular plants. And uh, really, there isn't much change uh, mm. in the last uh, 20 million years, except for the last 2 million years, when we start to have uh, seemingly weaker monsoons, most likely related to glacial conditions. And so the, it looks like the, the monsoon forcing, the rainfall forcing, hasn't changed all that much. And if anything, it might have been actually, on average, stronger um, back then in the Miocene than, than, uh, than it's been in the in more recent times. Okay, so anybody else? So if you have any question, go ahead on yourself. Yeah. So I, yeah. Hi, Boye. Gotcha. Uh, thanks yeah. for a really nice How talk. Um, so I was wondering, do you, you know, do you think there could be anything, any role for the floodplain to play in the sort of increase in the organic carbon concentration over the five million years, or is it already essentially sort of stable? Um, you know, do we know anything about the evolution of, of the floodplain? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, we know in the modern system that the flood pain is super important. Um, my feeling is that over that time period, the last five million years, it probably hasn't changed all that much in size. Uh, however, what might have changed drastically is the dynamic of the flood plane in response to um, sea level change. Because we know that, that the variability, the cyclicity in sea level over the last two million years has been you know, dramatically different from what it was certainly five million years ago. So we could definitely imagine that this could be a pretty strong lever uh, that, would, that would promote you know, some kind of a, a flushing um, protocol, if you wish, um, that, that would be more favorable to, to uh, uh, delivering and, and, and transferring carbon to the deep sea. Uh, that's mm -hmm. entirely possible. It, one thing that, that we looked at in the uh, sedimentary system is whether we could see a, a change in the architecture of uh, the deposits where, whereby you would have more lovey, fewer lovies or more lovies or bigger lovies or, or whatever, you know, that could relate to this change in, uh, in sea level that, that most likely came with uh, pretty um, interesting, you know, uh, variability in the connection between the, the rivers and, and the sea fan. And we, we didn't see much uh, over the sand scale. It doesn't seem to be changing all that much. Um, but that remains an open question. It might be something we could look at through uh, some weathering proxies you know, that, that intuitively could be quite sensitive to footprint weathering, things like lithium isotopes, for instance, uh, might be a, a very interesting way to look at this. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if it sort of, you know, has, has something to do with the processing or, you know, the the oxidation of the carbon or whatever, how it survives the floodplain and that's changing, I don't know. Could it just be positive loop maybe? There's a bit of cooling and suddenly, you know, the carbon can survive the floodplain a bit better and that sort of, you know, then, you know, it enters that positive feedback loop, I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, we, we are, the, the strangeness of this is that when we look at it over the last glacial and interglacial uh, oscillation, we actually don't see much. It's, it seems like the efficiency remains the same. Most likely the flux don't, but the efficiency remains uh, quite similar. Um, so I have a feeling that this is mostly related to more of a you know, boundary condition type of change. Um, mm. 
but it's it's hard at this point to put a finger on exactly what that is. Now, the extent of the footprint probably hasn't varied much over the last five million years. Uh, if you look at the whole 20 million years, yes, it, it, it's changed quite, quite some. All right, thanks. Uh, really, there's a couple of questions in the chat. And uh, so, uh, Shimi, you want to ask or you want to, you know? Oh yeah, the change in sediment source uh, around uh, eight to five million year. Uh, so that is the um, um, exposure of the lesser Himalayan uh, series that happen to have uh, a quite a distinct uh, ice top composition in these ice top systems. And, uh, and that, that more or less um, you know, matches what you would expect in terms of, uh, uh, of the timing. I mean, that, that, that started around 10 to 12 million years ago and then became more progressively more and more uh, important and visible. Um, any relationship with increasing organic carbon percent? I, we don't see, we looked into this and we don't seem to see any, any systematic change in uh, sediment composition that would go along with the increase in, in carbon concentration. Uh, next question, Junji. Um, aha, did you mention the long-term behavior of uh, petrogenic organic carbon weathering? No, I did not. Um, the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, it's not a very, very big lever in this system, so I don't think it's, uh, it's going to matter all that much, unlike in systems where you have sedimentary rocks with much higher carbon concentrations, uh, like in Taiwan, for instance. Um, however, it, anecdotally, when we've looked at these sediments, we have seen the same markers for petrogenic carbon that we have in, in a more recent sediments, but I don't have a quantitative reconstruction of um, oxidation flux of petrogenic carbon yet. That's very difficult to, to get to, by the way. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Shani. Uh, where is the organic carbon coming from? Um, yeah, so we can we can speak to this some. Uh, question is about the provenance of the organic carbon, whether it comes from the High Himalaya and Tibet or, or, or down lower. Uh, we know in the modern system it comes mostly from the lower reaches. Um, based on all isotope measurements of both carbon and hydrogen. Uh, we think that this has been the case throughout. So most likely um, a pretty stable system dominated by uh, downstream inputs of carbon to, to the system as opposed to you know, high elevation. Even though we do see physically uh, some evidence of high, high elevation uh, provenance, uh, for instance, in these wood debris. How did you estimate the petrogenic carbon oxidation flux? Uh, so we only estimated it for the modern system. And the modern system, uh, the estimation is actually based on the solids as opposed to looking at the uh, products. Uh, so we looked at uh, source rocks and rivers draining uh, source rocks. And then we compare uh, petrogenic carbon concentrations there with those that we could measure down uh, lower in Bangladesh. And then by different uh, estimated uh, the oxidation flux. There's other ways to go about this. Uh, Bob talked about it uh, at great length a few weeks ago. Uh, you can use rhenium, uh, dissolved rhenium, for instance, and things like that. It's been tried a little bit on the Ganges, and that seems to converge towards the same type of, uh, of numbers. OK, Any, anybody else? Any question? Any more question? Okay, now it's 10, almost 10, 10, 10. Uh, so, uh, really, thank you so much. And uh, so, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a wonderful. I, I believe there's uh, still many unanswered questions left. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. That's for sure. I think we might, we might have uh, brought up more questions than answers. Uh, yeah. that's, that's usually how it works.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that's that's great. Uh, and as always, this talk has already been uh, uh, archived on our YouTube. So uh, if uh, you know you want to send to your friend, your student, you welcome go to our YouTube channel. So okay, Vali, thank you so much uh, for this fantastic talk. My pleasure, Paul. Thanks for you.